We are on chapter, the last chapter of A Long Way from Chicago by Richard Peck. It is Centennial Summer, 1935. I was 15 the last summer we went down to Grandma's. Mary Alice was 13, so we both thought we were too old for this sort of thing. Next year, I'd be in line for a summer job in Chicago, if I could find one. Mary Alice was about to sail into eighth grade, which put her in shooting distance of high school. We both assumed an air of weary worldliness as we climbed down off the Wabash Blue Bird one last time. But the train hadn't pulled out before we noticed a difference. The depot was swagged in red, white, and blue bunting. Where the old drifters keep moving sign used to hang, a new billboard in fancy lettering read, Welcome to the Centennial Celebration, A Century of Progress, 1835 to 1935. See our Ladies' Hospitality Committee for a complete list of centennial activities. Gentlemen, grow a beard or pay a fine. You're in trouble right there, Mary Alice remarked to me. We both sighed. We were still kids, so we liked everything to stay the same. Now the whole town seemed to be up to something. What's all this about? We asked Grandma when we got to her house. The centennial celebration? Nothing but an excuse for people to mill around, waste time, make horses patooties of themselves. I hope I never live to see another one. Considering that the next centennial celebration would be in the year 2035, we didn't think Grandma would have a problem with that. Over dinner, she added, there'll be a parade, of course, and we can watch it from the porch. As we tucked into big slabs of sour cream raisin pie, Grandma observed, they're putting on a talent show. We might look into that. We don't have to stay till the end. Then after dinner, she said, you two going to have to climb up to the attic and go through them trunks again. What for, said Mary Alice, who hated the attic. Well, for pity's sake, Grandma said, quite impatient. You and me's going to have to wear old time long dresses. She aimed a fork at me. And you're going to have to wear a historical getup too. At least she didn't comment on the fact that I couldn't raise a beard though her glance did skim my chin. Grandma, Mary Alice clutched her head. What's happening? It's a centennial celebration, Grandma said. We're all going back to the old days and the old ways for one week. Grandma, I said, you never gave up any of your old ways. Ha, she said, a lot you know. And while you're up in the attic, look around for that old churn. It's how we used to make butter. Bring it on down. The attic was as hot as hinges, and nothing had changed since last year. For pity's sake, don't mention those old coal oil lamps, Mary Alice whispered to me. She'll shut off the electricity and make us use them. We made a quick survey of the trunk full of dress patterns and the one with the buffalo robe in it. In, in old suit boxes under the eaves, we found folded clothes that went back way, way back before the war. Mary Alice's forehead was greasy now, and we were both down on all fours, pawing through the strange old dresses and funny shoes. What are you finding? came Grandma's voice from below. Grandma, you're not going to be able to get into any of these clothes. <clears throat> Mary Alice hollered down. No, but you can, Grandma hollered back. I grinned, and Mary Alice wilted. And then she came on another box with a lot of brittle old tissue paper inside. Aha, she said drawing out an old black coat with braid around the lapels, then a waistcoat with many, many buttons, and then a shirt with a high collar attached by another button, a pair of drain pipe pants, a string tie, and a derby hat. Made for you, Mary Alice crowed. She was beginning to enjoy herself, and I was sorry to see that. I'll look like Brochier the Undertaker in that stuff, I said. I'll look like a house horse's patootie. I just want to go home. Mary Alice burrowed under more tissue box. Oh, look, she said. She held up a dress finer than all the others. White going yellow with age. It had a high collar of flaking lace. Made for you, I said. But Mary Alice didn't mind. She ran a careful hand over it. Seed pearls, she murmured. In another box, there was nothing but cut velvet curtains with fringes at the bottom. Just curtains, I said. Cut velvet with fringe, Grandma thundered from below. Yes, we yelled back. Bang them down, she roared, and don't forget the churn. 
After Mary Alice twice said that she was so hot that she might throw up, we left. We took everything we'd found in the, with us, clothes, curtains, churn, half the attic. Grandma was nowhere about. Let's see if these clothes fit, Mary Alice said. Let's not. Joey, you know we're going to have to wear this stuff, she said. I went to my room and skinned off my pants and shirt, and then I put on the old white shirt with the stiff front. It came to my knees, but I could push the sleeves up. The drainpipe pants were a fit when I gave the legs extra cuff. It took me a while buttoning up the vest. I liked the coat. It gave me shoulders. The string tie was like a bootlace, so I could tie it by looking in the mirror. And then I thought, why not? And I put on the derby hat. It went down to my ears and it balanced there. I strolled out into the hall and stepped back. Mary Alice stood there posing in the old white dress. She was beginning to develop a figure, more or less, but the dress had a figure of its own, narrow in the waist and generous above. I stuck in some tissue paper, she said quietly, glancing down. Her chin balanced on the high lace collar and she reached down onto the folds of the skirt that swirled onto the floor. But there's something wrong, she said. Behind. Turn around, I said. The dress fitted her like a glove above the waist. What's all this? She patted an enormous artificial behind, swagged with seed pearls. I think they called it a bustle, I said. But how did she sit down? Search me, I answered. Mary Alice turned back. You look good, she said. The hat's dumb, but you look good. So do you. Though I'd never noticed it before, Mary Alice was going to be a quite nice-looking girl. I'm surprised boy, I suppose boys would be hanging around her pretty soon, and it was a thought that I had never had before. Let's show Grandma, she said. With a dainty gesture, she lifted her skirts as she started down the stairs. I followed, sweaty in the two wool layers. Grandma wasn't in the kitchen or in the front room. We found her in the little sewing room off of the downstairs bedroom. She was bending over her old treadle singer sewing machine, threading a bobbin. Mary Alice rustled the, her bustle in, and I followed. Just before Grandma turned up to see us, I took off the derby hat. I put it in the crook of my arm, just like we were an old tintype picture in a fancy frame. Mary Alice held out the silky skirt. Grandma turned from her sewing machine, and she froze. An instant of silence fell where you could hear a wasp on the windowsill. And then Grandma swept the spectacles off her nose, and she wiped a hand quickly across her eyes. We quaked. We had not seen her like this before. You give me a turn, she said. She put her hand out to us and took it back. I thought it was me and Dowled on our wedding day. On our wedding day. Of course these were wedding clothes. They'd lived together all these years, separate in their boxes, together. How did you sit? Mary Alice said, turning to show the bustle. To one side, Grandma said, on one of your haunches. Then you let the skirts fan out on the floor. I only wore it that one day. She couldn't take her eyes off of us and her eyes were full. We three were at the breakfast table the next morning in our regular clothes with a sharp foot, when a foot, sharp footstep sounded on the back porch. A round figure with a head cocked like a bird filled the screen. It was Mrs. L. J. Wiedenbach, the banker's wife. Grandma looked up from her breakfast, scrapple and corn syrup with a side of bacon. Only ten after six, Grandma muttered, and she's already griddled and galvanizing. <laughs> Mrs. Wiedenbacher must have been desperate because she'd lowered herself to come into Grandma's back door. Oh, Mrs. Dowdle, she said through the screen wire. You see before you a woman at the end of her rope. I wish, Grandma murmured. Mrs. Wiedenbacher dared to open the screen door and slip inside on her teetery, high-heeled shoes. Dad had taught me to stand up when our lady enters the room, but a look from Grandma kept me in my place. Mrs. Dowell, as the head of the Ladies' Hospitality Committee for the Centennial Celebration, I have come to fling myself at your feet. We of the committee have worked our fingers to the bone to make this celebration worthy of the town's tradition. Now, on the eve of the event, my committee members are dropping like flies. You will have heard how Mrs. Askew had been brought low. Mrs. Weedle voices, Mrs. Weedlebach's voice fell. Female troubles. 
Grandma's specks were riding down on her nose, and she looked up over them. Oh, yes, Cora Askew's insides have been given a public airing. And then there's Mrs. Forrest Pugh's nervous condition. Mrs. Wiedebach inside. Mrs. Dowdle, I'll put it to you straight. Our committee has more than it can manage, handling our programs, setting up chairs, arranging for prizes, keeping the ladies' public restroom tidy. It's not glorious work, Mrs. Dowdle, but it's meaningful. I thought you might step in and lend us a hand. We understand that at this time of your life, you are not as active as you once were, but we are in great hopes that you will rise to the occasion. I thought Grandma might rise to the occasion and throw the kitchen table at Mrs. Wiedenbach. Mary Alice and I got ready to run. Mrs. Wiedenbach's hands plunged into her bosom and drew up a lacy hanky. I can do no more, she said, dabbing at her mouth. I will have my hands full with Daddy during the celebration itself. As a 90-year-old veteran of the Civil War, Daddy is bound to carry off the honor of being the oldest settler, and he will need all of my support. He, but he's bound to win, Miss Wiedenbacher looked suddenly uncertain. Unless Aunt Puss Chapman... Nah, Grandma waved a strip of bacon. You couldn't blast Aunt Puss off her place with a charge of dynamite. Well then, Miss Swedenbacher said reassured, and I will have to be on hand for the talent show, she continued. My nephew is entering it with a dramatic reading, and I must be there for that boy. Ah, Grandma said. Let me see if I hear this right. At this time of my life, my hearing isn't what it used to be. Mary Alice and I stared at each other. All of her whoppers, this was Grandma's crowning achievement. She had ears on her like an Indian scout. You want me to swab out toilets while you run your old daddy for the oldest settler and your nephew for public speaker, or did my ears deceive me? Well, I wouldn't have put it quite like that, Mrs. Wiedenbacher dabbed all around on her neck. I'm busy as a bird dog myself these days, Grandma said. I've got my grandkids visiting, as you may have noticed, and my tomatoes are coming on, and I'm rushed off my feet. Grandma sprawled in her chair, the picture of ease. You don't mean you're canning tomatoes on Centennial Week? Miss Wiedenbacher goggled. Tomatoes wait for no man, Grandma said, gazing at the door. Defeated, Miss Wiedenbach took the hint and retreated. We listened to her heels pecking off the porch. I wiped the last scrapple around my plate in the corn syrup. Mary Alice examined her fingernails, waiting. Grandma was deep in thought, and we were passing the time until she came to a conclusion. She slapped the oil class at last. No rest for the weary, she said, climbing to her feet. She ran a hand down the small of her back, though there was none too small. Not enough hours in the day. We picking tomatoes, Grandma? I asked, testing her. What? She said. She glanced down at Mary Alice. Bring your tap shoes. My tap shoes? Mary Alice clutched her head, which she often did these days. Grandma, I haven't taken up tap since I was a kid. Give it up, did you? Grandma said. Ages ago, Mary Alice sniffed. I'm taking ballroom dancing now to get ready for high school mixers and formals and semi-formal evenings. Grandma pondered, fingering her chins. Then she said to me, find my gum boots. We're going to the high grass and tall timbers. Take us a better part of the day to get there and back on shank ponies. Which meant we'd be walking. Grandma, oops, I lost my place. When I didn't find her gumboots in the cellar, she sent me to the cob house. As I passed through the kitchen, I noticed Grandma and Mary Alice had their heads together, conspiring. The only light in the cob house came from the open door, but I could see the phantom's, phantom brakeman's old overcoat hanging on a peg. Under it stood Grandma's gumboots. When I reached down for them, a boot moved. Remembering cotton mouse, I recoiled. My hands were in my armpits when I heard the sound. One of the boots mewed. I'd forgotten about the old tomcat, but then he'd have jumped at me by now if he'd been around. A kitten's face appeared out of the top of the boot, pointy ears, whiskers, and big green eyes. She mewed at me again and tried to get a paw up. I reached down for her. She was gray with a white bib and boots. She only weighed ounces, and she kept her claws in when I tucked her in my arm and carried her back to the house with the gum boots. In the kitchen, Grandma had been gar her gardening hat on with the chigger veil. She was packing our lunches with a couple of early tomatoes and some salt for them and a twist of paper. I drew nigh and planted the kitten on the table behind her, beside her. Get that thing out of the house, she barked. 
but neither the kitten nor I were fooled. The kitten butted Grandma's hand. Then she rubbed herself along Grandma's arm and Grandma let her. Got a new pet? I inquired. Chicago people have pets, she said. But there's a new litter living down in the cop house now, and I let them. They keep down the vermin. Don't need all them, though. She Gently she lifted the kitten and put her in the hamper with our lunch. We'll drown this one in the creek on their way, she said. But I wasn't worried. What happened to the old cat? I asked, meaning the jumping tom. Got in front of the cannonball, Grandma said briefly. She was sitting to tug her gum boots on now, and she was already wearing man's pants under her apron and dress. Grandma, are we going to go see Aunt Puss Chapman? I said, trying to see a little bit ahead. I'm going farther out in the sticks than that, she said, grunting. Whatever for? To see if an old feller name of Uncle Grady Griswold still living, and his wife, Aunt May. By now I knew that not everybody around here called uncle or aunt was necessarily your uncle or your aunt. Why do we want to know? Because if he's alive, Uncle Grady would be 103 years old. The sun had already begun to punish us by the time we crossed the bridge over Salt Creek. I was carrying the hamper and mews came from within. Grandma had forgotten to drown the kitten. We walked a long way over Rose and we skimmed the terraplane eight. Mary Alice wasn't with us. She was elsewhere. Mary Alice was up to something. By noon, we were nearly out of the county. We crossed Route 36, but Grandma trudged on. We ate our lunch in a pasture. The kitten climbed out and fed from our hands, and then she stalked around in the weeds, teaching herself to jump at butterflies. When it was time to go, she climbed back into the hamper. We cut across the fields from there to a little house at the end, a faint lane. Somebody lived there. Chickens were in the brooder house and the garden was in and weeded. Hollyhock stood guard along the fence. Grandma pushed open the front door. It was a parlor from some other time with faded love knots on the wallpaper. Beside a cold stove sat an old lady and on the other side of the rocker sat the oldest man on earth in a stocking cap. Grandma sighed with satisfaction to see them both breathing. Aunt May Griswold grinned at Grandma. Both had, both her teeth gleamed in the, gl the gloom of the room. How you been, Aunt May? Oh, yes, Aunt May agreed. Very warm for this time of year. She wore gardening gloves and a variety of shawls. How are your feet? Grandma thundered at her. Are they still swelling on you? Not bad, Aunt May said. They're still pretty good layers. We got eight or ten dozen eggs off them every day and sell what we don't get to the cow, what we don't eat to the cowgills. <clears throat> Grandma returned to Uncle Grady. Speak right up to him, Aunt May called out. He's a little hard of hearing. Uncle Grady Griswold was almost as small as he was old. The pom-pom of his stocking cap hung far down his humped shoulder. He was so old, he'd have made Aunt Puss Chapman look like a young girl at her first party. He gazed uninterested up at Grandma. How you been, Uncle Grady? She said, speaking up. Fair piddling, he said weakly. Grandma lifted the kitten out of the hamper by the scruff of its neck. I brought you a mouser. Uncle Grady blinked at the hanging kitten and seemed to rally. Pour right here, he said. And Grandma lowered the kitten into his bony lap, where she offered her head for petting. Do you get up and around, Uncle Grady? Oh, yes, he said in a stronger voice. I wrung the neck of a chicken this morning before daylight. Did you have chicken for your dinner? No, he said. She got away. Ah, Grandma said. Listen, Uncle Grady, do you still have your old army uniform? He stared and the kitten looked up in alarm. He waved two small shriveled fists. Has war been declared? He'd have jumped out of his chair ready to enlist, but Grandma put a hand on him. Nothing like that, she said. Well, I'm ready, he piped up. I'm cockered and primmed. My full kit's in the bedroom there. He pointed a crooked finger. We step downstairs now. We sleep downstairs now because May can't climb the stairs. She's getting on in years. Grandma nodded me toward the kitchen. Don't forget my sword, Uncle Grady called after me, seeming not to wonder who I was. Aunt May looked on, interested. I found his full kit, uniform, sword, boots, and spurs, and a cap. They didn't smell very good, and they didn't look right to me. Grandma, I muttered, holding up the small coat. There's something funny about the uniform. 
The only Civil War uniform I've ever seen up close was Mrs. L. J. Wiedenbacher's dad. Uncle Grady was on our side. Was Uncle Grady on our side? Of course he was on our side, she said. But he goes back before the Civil War. He was in the Mexican War. They winged me at the Battle of Cerro Gordo, Uncle Gordy offered. I stared. We'd covered the Mexican War in school that year. Grandma, the Mexican War started almost 90 years ago. Even if Uncle Grady was 103, he'd only have been about my age during the war. The war. Well, maybe he was a little drummer boy, Grandma suggested. Rum tum tum, Uncle Grady said, playing an imaginary drum with invisible drumsticks. Grandma turned to the other rocker. Can I borrow Uncle Grady for the day on Saturday, Aunt May? She howled. You sure can, honey, Aunt May said. In fact, you can keep him. She'd heard every word and she grinned broadly. On the first day of the centennial celebration, the town began to fill up with merrymakers and the curious. People came in farm wagons and fords from as far away as Benmet and Tuscaloosa. Grandma closed all of her windows because the dust from the road never settled. People came for the event, the tree toppings, the chicken plucking competitions, and the chili cook-off. They marveled at the flower shows put on by the ladies of the United Brethren Church and the mother-daughter look-alike contest the spelling bee and the Illinois Power and Light Company's display of rural electrification and the three-legged race. I hadn't seen hide nor hoof mark of Mary Alice all day. That evening, Grandma and I had quite quiet supper at the kitchen table under the ceiling light and the flypaper strips. This was the night of the talent show. I knew we were going, even after she poured a second cup of coffee and stifled a yawn like she was thinking of bed. Well, I guess you'll want to look in on that show, she remarked. But I was 15 now and wise to her, and I stifled a yawn. Doesn't matter to me. We don't have to stay till the end. She was on her feet now, making short work of the dishes. <laughs> the stage was a barnyard in the park, and it was the headlights running, lit with headlights running off of car batteries. We chose a back bench because nobody wanted to sit behind grandma and we could see everybody from there. The audience was mostly town people because the farmers had all gone home to do their chores, but there was a good turnout. Mr. And Mrs. L.J. Wiedenbacher were up in the front row, of course. On the table by a bandstand waited the loving, waiting, waited the loving cup for first prize and the scrolls for second, third, and honorable mention. Just as the crowd was getting restless, the first act began. A man playing a musical saw. Grandma sat through that with both hands clamped on her knees. Afterwards, she remarked that it had been more saw than music. Then we saw a barbershop quartet. Though they called themselves the sons of the prairie pioneers and all wore beards, they were Mrs. Earl T., Mr. Earl T. Askew and three more of the sheriff's deputies. Practice had improved them some and they didn't sing the night that Patty Murphy died in mixed company. They did a medley that included just a song at twilight, and after a round of applause, they came back for sweet Adeline. Grandma wasn't about to clap for deputies. She began to fidget. The vocal part of the program continued with the choir from Mrs. Effie Wilcox's church. They did a sweet hour of prayer, the old rugged cross, and I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. These got no response from the United Brethren members. But the choir returned for an encore anyway with the tambourine to sing Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And scoop me from the mire, take me up to glory, snatched from eternal fire. If I hadn't known better, I'd have thought that grandma was ready to leave. She was fidgeting all over the bench. And then a boy clumped onto the stage. He was about fifth grade or an overgrown fourth. His hair was parted in the middle and he'd painted artificial freckles all over his moon face. His costume was high top shoes and old time breeches held up by one suspender. That's my nephew, everybody, Mrs. L.J. Wiedenbacher called out from the front row. He cleared his throat and he began to recite. Ain't I glad I ain't a girl, hands to wash and hair to curl, skirts a flapping round my knees, ain't I glad that that ain't me. The boy planted his fists on his pudgy hips and he looked out over the audience. Grandpa says it's just a chance that I got to wearing pants. Says that when a kid is small, they put dresses on them all. Then they kick 
then that they that kicks and makes a noise gets promoted into boys. Them that sits and twist their curls, they just leaves them, calls them girls. He took his bow to a spatter of applause that grew. All of Mrs. Weedenbacher's friends stood to clap and they were joined by everybody who, owned, who owed the bank money. The boy kept bowing. That made me about half sick, Grandma remarked. At this point, we could have used an intermission, but Mrs. Merle Stubbs of the ladies' committee mounted the stage carrying a portable Victoria. She threw wide its doors and wound it up. Crank it up, Lula, somebody called out, and the crowd tittered. Mrs. Stubbs dropped a record on the turntable and withdrew. They'd have dimmed the lights now, but the car batteries were weakening anyway. Music from a full orchestra welled out on the Victoria. It was a waltz. When I grow too old to dream, I'll have you to remember. From nowhere, a couple glided onto the bandstand. He was tall, dark, and handsome, and he seemed to be wearing a tuxedo. And in his big hands, he held a girl, the vision of a girl. Headlights caught the glimmer of her white gown as he twirled her in easy circles. Her graceful hand held up her flowing skirts. The crowd held its breath. It was like a movie coming to life. The seed pearls on the girl's dress flashed pale fire. I looked again, and behind the careful makeup and below the swooped up hair, it was Mary Alice, and she turned in the walls. A bustle came into view. I nudged Grandma hard, but she was completely caught up in the sight of Mary Alice sweeping around the stage in Grandma's own wedding gown. But who was her partner? He was dipping her almost to the floor now, though you couldn't tell who was leading, who was leading who. I squinted and I saw it was Ray Veach. Ray Veach of Veach's Gas and Oil was wearing Grandpa Donald's wedding suit with the, cu with the cuffs let all the way down. Ray Veach was a man's man who spent his life under a car with grease up to his elbows. Ray Veach and Mary Alice, my world tilted. Now the waltz was winding down. Ray and Mary Alice came out even with it. Still clinging to one of his big hands, she collapsed to the floor in an elegant curtsy. Her skirts fanned out in every direction. And after a moment of stunned silence, the crowd was on its feet. They were getting up on the benches and clapping over their heads in applause like summer thunder. Grandma stood, patting her hair back in a satisfied way. She said, we don't need to stay to the end. We were up way before daybreak on Saturday. While the dew was still on the roses, the road outside Grandma's house was thronged with people coming from in from as far away as Argentina and Farmer City for the parade. But we were working right up to the last minute on our float. At the stroke of 11, the parade stepped off with the high school bands of the three nearest towns, high schools. Next, in the order of the profession, were five tractor-drawn hay framers jammed with members of the Piatt County Democratic Party. They were followed by Mr. L.J. Wiedenbach in a decorated hupmobile car carrying all four Republicans. The Odd Fellows Drum and Bugle Corps followed. On their heels mounted, trotted the anti-horse theft society members, done up as old-time bounty hunters in big hats and drooping mustaches. Then came the first float. Miss L.J. Wiedenbacher had outdone herself, aided by a club she belonged to, the Order of the Eastern Star. Their float was a flatbed international harvester truck banked in flowers. In the kitchen chair sat Mrs. Wiedenbacher's old daddy in full Civil War blue and his decoration from the Grand Army of the Republic. He seemed to have no idea where he was. Surrounding him on the flatbed were the Eastern Star Ladies, garbed in Grecian drapings. Mr. L. J. Wiedenbacher was there too. I mean, Mrs. L. J. Wiedenbacher was there too, in a vast hoop skirt, holding her daddy upright. Above him, a sign roped in rambling roses read, Oldest Seller in the Community, Born 1845, Decorated Veteran of the Civil War. By rights, this float should have been followed by a marching platoon from the Women's Christian Temperance Union carrying the signs, strong drink is a mocker. But somehow our float cut in. It was another hay frame, this one from Cowgill's Dairy Farm. Flanking in on foot were the Cowgill brothers who had all grown up to be good Christian men, except for Ernie who was in jail. 
The horse that pulled our hay frame was the one that usually pulled the cowgill's milk wagon. It had its work cut out for it because there was a lot happening on our float. At the front was a sweating yellow mound that had been a cow carved out of butter before the sun got to it. Nearby stood Mary Alice in her ball gown, bowing to the crowd and holding up the loving cup for first place in the talent show. I rode up there with her wearing Grandpa Dowdle's wedding suit because, F because Ray wouldn't ride on a float. Behind us sat Mrs. Effie Wilcox on a three-legged stool. She was demonstrating the use of the pioneer butter churn, and her eyes roamed all over the crowds beside the street. And at the back of the float was a throne, though it was only a platform rocker from Grandma's front room. On a pile of pillows to give him a stature sat Uncle Grady Griswold in full uniform. The sun sparkled off the tip of the sword he held aloft. He could no more raise a beard than I could, so he looked like a beaming boy. To lend him support, Grandma stood beside him, her feet planted wide. She was another Grandma, one we'd never seen before. Her costume was an enormous and complicated old-fashioned gown made out of cut velvet and fringe, the curtains. Its bustle overhung the rear of the hay frame, and the front of it scooped breathtakingly low on her bosom. She topped herself with Adelia Eubanks' sunbonnet. Loose in her hand hung Grandpa Dowdle's 12-gauge Winchester. After all, it was an antique. Above them hung a sign, a sheet stretched between clothesline poles. It had taken me half the night to letter it. Uncle Grady Griswold, born 1832 and winged in the Mexican War, by far the oldest settler in the community. Just the sight of Grandma herself silenced the crowds. But by the time we were trundling past the coffee pot cafe and Uncle Grady was brandishing his sword, the applause began. Into Mary Alice's ears, I murmured, but why Ray Vici? I saw possibilities in him, she said coolly, showing off her loving cup to the crowds. I didn't know he could dance. Dance, Mary Alice sniffed. He can barely walk. What do you think I've been doing all week? I've been giving him ballroom dancing lessons. And the big club hopper tramped all over my feet. I'm crippled for life. The route of the parade crossed the Wabash tracks at the depot to give the other side of the town a look. But the Bluebird train pulled in from Chicago right on schedule, and it blocked the way and separated the parade just short of the Wiedenbacher float, which drew up short. The cowgirl's overworked old horse dragging our hay frame didn't notice. It clopped on and ran into Mrs. Wiedelbacher's float. We bumped. I reached for Mary Alice to keep her from tangling in her skirts and pitching off the float. Mrs. Wilcox teetered on her stool. Of course, Mrs. Wiedenbacher knew we were right behind her, crabbing her act with the oldest settler, with an older settler than her daddy. And her reciting nephew had finished out the had finished out of the money at the talent show, so she was already upset and off her feed with us. But now her old daddy turned around and looked back. He may not have known where he was, but there was nothing wrong with his eyesight. He had read our sign over Uncle Grady with his old pink eyes narrowed, and he spoke sharply to his oldest daughter, who had laid a restraining hand on him. And then it all happened rather quickly. Mrs. Wiedenbacher's daddy slipped free of her, leaped out of his kitchen chair, and jumped off their float. He cocked his forage cap at the dangerous angle, and he stalked back to our hay frame. Glaring up at Uncle Grady, he howled, You yellow-bellied old buzzard, if you'd fought in the Mexican War, we'd have lost. Seeming to consider this, Uncle Grady gazed down, and then he hollered, Them's fighting words, and I declare war. Before Grandma could stop him, he charged off his throne balanced a moment on the edge of our float, and threw himself into space. He lit on Mrs. Wiedenbacher's daddy, and they both rolled in the streets, locked in combat. Their medals and weaponry clanged like wild bells ringing out. Don't use the sword, Uncle Grady, Grandma cried. <laughs> By now, the Wabash Bluebird should have pulled out, but all the passengers were at the window, staring at the spectacle. Two of the oldest men alive were brawling in the street, tangled up in each other and Uncle Grady's sword, their small fists throwing punches. 
Now they were so covered in dust and droppings, you couldn't tell one uniform from the other. In the distance from the other side of town, the last of the high school bands blared the stars and stripes forever. At length, Mrs. Wiedenbacher separated the two old warriors, then took her, though her hoop skirt got in the way. Grandma would have let them fight it out. She came to the depot to see us off the day we left. It was to be our last visit together, and I suppose she knew, but she didn't say so. As the bluebird appeared down the tracks, I had something to ask her. Grandma, there's a loose end in my mind. Well, don't trip over it, she said. How do you know Uncle Grady Gridwall is 103 years old? How do you know he's not? She held her spidery old black umbrella between herself and the sun. What I mean is, does he have a birth certificate or something like that? A birth certificate? She waved me away. They didn't have birth certificates in them days. You were just born and people accepted it. By now the train was pulling in and hissing steam. So that was the last word. As Mary Alice and I scrambled aboard, Grandma heaved up the picnic hamper for us. We were hardly out of town before we both slumped half asleep in the seat. A trip to Grandma really took it out of you. Dozing, I heard a mew. I looked down at our feet to see the lid rising on the picnic ha hamper and two green eyes peeped out. I shot a look at Mary Alice, who was only pretending to be asleep. What's that? She blinked in surprise at the green eyes blinking back. For heaven's sake, she said, it's the kitten, poor little thing. It took her three days to find her way back from Uncle Grady's to the cob house. Grandma must have stuck her in the hamper, meaning me to have her. What a surprise. And yet you don't look too surprised. You could knock me over with a feather, Mary Alice sniffed and lifted the kitten up onto her lap. How do you know mother's gonna let you keep that kitten? How do you know she's not? Mary Alice said. As we steamed on riding the Wabash Bluebird bound for Chicago across the patch work fields. And that is the end of the chapter Centennial, which was the year 1935, I believe. 1935. Centennial Summer.